Welcome to Eureka. I am Gohar Razai and you are watching Eureka. Let me begin by telling a story once again. There was a person who was involved intensely, a young man called Everest. He used to get very angry when people called him Everest. And when British started Great Triangulation Project, that time he was made in charge. He had a serious problem. He trained people. There were big theodolites, there were chains, etc., etc. And it involved a lot of calculations. He trained people and as he moved mapping India, the entire subcontinent, towards north, he faced a massive problem of a disease. His workers used to fall sick and some of them died. He issued instruction that nobody is allowed to sleep without mosquito net. And during the day, he ordered everybody to use gloves and gum boots. Somehow he related malaria with mosquito. This is the beginning of 19th century. Over a period of time, scientists investigated and in the last decade of 19th century came to the firm conclusion that malaria is caused by mosquito. The entire cycle, malarial cycle as it is known today, was mapped out by a scientist called Ronald Ross, who again was working in India in Calcutta. Now here is a scientist today who has picked up the threads and is working on malaria and done a path breaking work. Welcome Saman Habib. Saman is working in CDRI and right from the beginning you have been working in Central yes, Drug Research my, Institute. After my PhD, after I was at NII PhD. for another year and then I moved straight to CDRI. Why didn't you join NII? I didn't, I guess they didn't want me, I don't know. <laughs> no, the reason was that there was a position advertised at CDRI and uh, it was in an area which I wanted to work in and also it was a totally independent position. So it seemed like a good idea to move. Okay, let's go back to the memories of uh, childhood. Uh, how do you look back at Aligarh? How did it shape whatever you have been doing now and your personality? as a scientist? Well, I grew up in Aligarh and I was there till I did my class 10 after which I came to Delhi to study and of course uh, uh, my school which uh, where I studied had a fantastic biology teacher and as you know you know when you have good teachers there is this natural affinity towards that subject and I had very good teachers for civics and history and and biology so at that time there was this this worry you know what should I do as many children have you at remember that age. them? I remember them of course, Mrs. Pant was my biology teacher okay. and she was a fantastic teacher. And have you met after getting the awards? No, she is no more unfortunately, so I haven't but uh, you know their memory remains and they were, I mean she was a fantastic teacher, uh, very very committed and extremely exciting classes that she took. So that was I think the beginning of my interest in, bio in, in biology per se. But you know it's interesting how one thinks at that age. So of so so it turned out that I wanted to do biology after some you know worries about history or biology and so on. And then this the idea was that I wanted to do to do uh, agriculture. It was not and your sciences. elder brother who my elder was your role who, model maybe <laughs> to do science because you don't come. Perhaps, from. but he is more a physicist and he he used to do a lot of uh, you know experiments at home. This is my eldest brother. Uh, he kept us as assistants, so my other brothers and I were sort of assistants assisting him. Assistants and also admirers, you know, so he had an admiring audience to, you know, see him perform as a scientist. So that was good fun. And I think that really helped in the sense of, you know, having an atmosphere where one could uh, think of doing what one wanted to do. I think that was very important because... Uh, but how come uh, your family, your father is one of the most renowned historians? Why didn't you go into history? No, history was an option and I really enjoyed history as such. But you know, in this, it's funny that he discouraged me. 
he liked the fact that I liked history, but at that time he worried about the fact Professor that Professor Irfan Habib that, discouraged that, her that, daughter that, to do history. Yeah, but he said that you know, do what you like. There's no pressure. Um, it shouldn't become a family thing. You know, I think that was more his worry uh, that it should not be that you know his daughter is also doing history. So he, no, he gave us a lot of freedom. No, but you come from a family of most renowned scholars in their own fields. Your maternal uncle, your mother. Uh, yeah. So, how did it shape? Uh, how much was the contribution of the school and how much was the contribution of the family itself? See, the family itself, because it gives you an academic sort of Your setup. Your grandfather. It gives you an academic setup to be in. It gives you a lot of books to sort of go through. And there is this whole freedom at home that to do what you want. I think that was the atmosphere we grew up in really. There was no compulsion on the subject one chose. There was a lot of, there was a lot of thing on rationality. There was a lot of thing on a scientific worldview. But there was no compulsion on the subject. And I think that's, that gave us a lot of freedom. So all of us, you know, brothers and sisters have done different things. Amba's a mathematician, Salman's a physicist, father's a cartographer. I took biology. And, uh, but there was, you know, when one is young, there is this great thing of being, do, of being very idealistic and doing something with, a, with an application. And my thing at that time was doing agricultural science. Transform the society. Transform the world. the world. Solve the food problem. You know? Solve, solve everything. <laughs> so problem. agricultural science was one big thing that I wanted to do at that time. And then I think my yeah, parents... But how, come, how come you landed up in, in uh, biology uh, when you wanted to do agriculture and science agriculture science yeah so then this is where the story is so then my mother wasn't very sure about this so she said talk to you talk to there's an, my, an uncle of mine was a very well known biologist and she said just talk to him and I talked to him and he was very smart he didn't say don't do whatever you know these people are very smart they don't say don't do this huh? <laughs> the say, you elder know, generation you, you are talking about yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he said well uh, you know take your time agricultural sciences can, can also be done after your BSc and your graduation it's not as if you have to go, go into it straight after your class 12 and and um, do a basic course and see what you like doing and if you still like doing agricultural science, go in for it. And he was right. I mean, when I did my BSc in botany, I started enjoying molecular biology and genetics much more than, you know, pure agricultural sciences. And then I moved on to do other things. And I think you need to give yourself time to sort of, you know, look at other things. There's so much interesting work going on, uh, you know, and then you sort of decide what is, some, what is the area you really what enjoy. What was the moment doing, when you, know? you clinched the issue that I'm going to do molecular biology? I think my second year BSc. Second year BSc. Yeah. Was some teacher responsible for that? No, there was no. a teacher strike. Hmm? And there was a long strike of the duta hmm. asking for better wages or something, I don't remember. And this is, uh, uh, you're talking about Delhi, Delhi University. University. And yeah. it, this gave us, so we had classes intermittently and there was a lot right. of free time. And in that free time, I used to study a lot of genetics. So I used to go to the library, get books, and do a lot of work on my own. Just enjoy doing it, you know, because it gave you time to do it, you know, yeah. apart from the course. And I think that's when I really got excited. I also had very good teachers, but, but you know, I think that the time to, to assimilate a subject and to do it on your own gives you a sort of confidence to be able to handle it. And I'm grateful that Duta went on strike for those two months. <laughs> <laughs> so a strike produced a first-rate no, scientist. I, only I have to take a break. Don't go anywhere. We'll come back. Welcome back to Eureka. We were discussing with Dr. Saman Habib how the initial period in Aligarh and then Delhi University molded her life as a scientist. This is the time when you take a decision that now it is molecular biology that you are going to work in. You have uh, mentioned somewhere that you read in a very interesting article uh, and, and that also shaped uh, your research in terms of uh, going into uh, malarial research. And uh, generally, you use the word very interesting article. Uh, so, scientific articles are interesting. A common person won't agree so with There you. is a story to this. You know, I, was, yeah. I had finished my PhD and I, in my PhD in NII, I had worked on a virus called the baculovirus. So, it was a molecule. So, no, I, was, I was looking at how the virus replicates and, you know, how, it, how there's an over overlap between transcription of, of its genes and replication of its DNA. And uh, it, was an, it was interesting work, but I was not working on malaria and I had not sort of done malaria. And as I finish, I was finishing, I, there was this article by Professor Jeff McFadden, who works in Australia, who's a botanist 
journalist, interestingly. Mm -hmm. And he, he writes beautifully. And he had this piece on the malaria Flair for language. Flair for language. Also very humorous, you know, if you can believe it in a scientific <laughs> way. And, uh, and uh, he wrote this article on my favorite organ. So scientists are not dry people. They shouldn't be. No. They shouldn't be. No. Some of them are. But uh, generally, outstanding scientists are very interesting people. Yeah, and I think they need and to do other things as well. Language. They have a, they should have a flair for language, yeah. and I think that makes it so much more interesting to read. Uh, and uh, so he had written this article on the malaria parasite, and it was interesting because just at that time, uh, in the parasite, people had discovered. I mean, Jeff McFadden and Wilson's group together had discovered the presence of a plastid. Now, if you this is something like a plant chloroplast. It's right. a reduced version of a chloroplast. And it was really intriguing that the malaria parasite, which is a human parasite, would have a remnant of a plastid. And uh, this became a really exciting for me as well because I came from a botany background and the right. fact that I could do disease work, infectious disease work, right. with, with, a, with something that I had studied, you know, also sort of brought my past back to me. Which and I didn't have anything to do with plants which didn't have anything to do with plants and this was a human disease that we, was, right. we were very worried about and that was very important to work on and also because the plastid uh, In brought layman's the language what you were trying to do was that uh, some people get infected and some people don't get infected and that was a uh, uh, very exciting that's another area question. But it is so so what so no, that, that, that that's not the epicoplast so now i do do two things in the lab and i'll come yeah. to it eventually so basically the epicoplast story is that you have a plant plastid in the malaria parasite and uh, the plastid has pathways that are not there in us because we don't have plant plastids right and because that happens you can actually think of designing drugs that would affect the plastid and therefore kill the parasite. And this right. plastid is essential for the malaria parasite. So if you and it would be a new method of it killing. It is a new method. So this whole... So it whole opens up a window exactly. for developing new drugs. Exactly. So the plastid then became a very exciting target for developing drugs against malaria. And to understand the biology and the pathways... Which and is the what is the mandate of your institute, mm -hmm. developing which new is, drugs. Yes. Yeah. yes. So I can reconcile basic research. And finding out new molecules and finding out new molecules and so that helped me reconcile basic researches of what I wanted to do to an ultimate purpose of of you know delineating pathways and bringing it to applied sites. level and yes. then to, to yes. developmental yes. level yes so it made me understand the parasite in the an evolutionary sense also investigate specific mechanisms and pathways and biochemical processes also see if these can be used to develop drugs and molecules and can these be now validated as drug targets for malaria. So the so new knowledge that was getting developed during the period when you were growing as a scientist mm -hmm. uh, which was based on DNA mm -hmm. uh, uh, in your opinion opened the new paths to do some other kind of research which will open yes. new questions as well as new yes. So when I was working on the malaria parasite at that time, the human genome sequence also came. And I guess that's what you're talking about. Yeah. So the other, pro the other project that I was uh, seriously involved in uh, was also to understand genetic variation in Indian populations. And this was as part of the Indian Genome Variation Consortium, which was a CSIR network project, as you know. Right. It was a very exciting project. There were seven institutes that were participating together. I think it was really a consortium in the true sense because we had extensive sessions in which we had you know, constant methodologies, we discussed work with each other. The idea was to map changes or variations, modifications in the sequences of disease genes. So genes that we would think would influence outcome of a particular disease. And I was interested in malaria. There were people who were interested in, you know, diabetes and asthma and many, yeah. many other things. So everybody had their own focus and we had our own. Some of them we, we have had in our program. Some of them you've had. That's excellent. So I was the malaria person in it. And because we were doing the whole population setup, we would get background information on Indian populations. Right. And, with us, and we were not looking at patients, right? I was not looking at malaria patients. I was looking at populations of India. Now, we know that malaria is endemic in some areas, is not endemic in the others. There are many okay. reasons for this. Vectors is one, the climate is another, many. But there's also this, this factor of human variation that some populations when have... Did you, when did you uh, come to this conclusion that this there was a factor of human variation this is a known thing the, uh, this is a known thing the, uh, in okay. the past people have worked on this in africa unfortunately people had not worked on it in india really in any you know serious sense but in africa there had been a lot of reports in kenyan populations you know there's a very famous kilifi population that's you know that's okay. resistant to malaria and so but so we wanted to see and then we compared endemic versus non endemic region populations and saw what are the differences and in which genes the differences lay Right. So if you have that kind of information, then you can do a comparative analysis of what is it that might, that might 
yeah. to be the factor influencing disease outcome and causing severity versus non severity in, in malaria infection. suppose you found so we found something yeah okay and then we went to patients yeah. now once you have clues then you know what to address in a patient group so then you can take okay. this from the population level to actually looking at malaria patients and having a cohort in which you do a case control study no no okay? uh, let me understand suppose mm -hmm. there is a gene mm -hmm. which is responsible for resistance mm -hmm. to malaria mm -hmm. malarial parasite mm -hmm. right and there are people who where this gene is missing and they get uh, they are prone to malaria now if you have found out that how do you use it gohar see this is not an application project i mean i you don't right. use it let me i tell you this okay. okay you don't use it you only understand Perfect. firstly huh? so because you know human genetics is it's is a bit it's risky i mean i can't say that if this is not diabetes this is an infectious disease parasite right. is growing inside your body correct many people get infection some people develop very severe disease some don't develop severe disease yeah. the way to control it of course control malaria control malaria mosquitoes uh, you know give drugs the thing yeah. is it you know when you are so i understand that okay this is how it's worked this is a particular susceptible group so to speak these people need special care so They at least you can come to the conclusion yes. that yes. in this area if the gene is missing in certain yeah. people which may develop uh, resistance therefore this is a special group and therefore it should be looked after yeah. people may By and should large. use I mean, uh, more nets probably this is oversimplification in the sense that there's yeah. never a single gene for infectious disease there are many 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 genes that right. contribute to your responses to immune the response to addition to yeah but <laughs> putting it very very simply to really you know reduce the problem to a, to one gene or one polymorphism yes essentially you look at susceptible groups and then you can say that look this is a population that's resistant you know so okay like you know we know tharu population in the terai belt right. that's lived there for a long time has fixation of an alpha thalassemia allele that gives resistance to malaria and is known that it's given them a lot of resistance and enable them to colonize at particular area because they have resistance to malaria and they don't get severe malaria okay so that's a very interesting observation in itself now right. so they are not a susceptible group really to look at but if there are people living in that zone who would not have that you know that polymorphism right. and therefore would be susceptible they need special care I'll have to take a break. It's mm -hmm. very interesting to discuss with you how the malaria, over a period of time, understanding about malaria has increased. Uh, we'll come back. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Eureka, Dr. Saman Habib of Central Drug Research Institute, which is a part of. a council of scientific industrial research an outstanding scientist and we were discussing your work which you have done did you at any point of time said to yourself eureka i have hit the jackpot of not knowledge yet. <laughs> not yet <laughs> not yet not yet um it's a long way to go it's a long way to go and you know things happen slowly in science we think that there is going to be one day when there is big discovery but it isn't i think it's the excitement of everyday experimentation that keeps you going i mean that's my over the last 15 years of zo as a researcher with students you know working every day i think it's it's that constant engagement that is more exciting i would probably not even want that eureka moment you know i'm not sure that i'm really <laughs> waiting for it at all i think i just enjoy the process of of doing science of doing experimentation of looking at results of analyzing them of this constant engagement with something of a, with a problem dr saman habib uh, cdri the institute that you join uh, for your first job as a scientist was one of the earliest institutes of constituent institutes of uh, council of scientific and industrial research has a long history of working on drugs especially when there was nothing that india could boast of as drug, drug development at that time this was conceived by our forefathers uh, how do you look back at the history of C uh, cdri I think it was, uh, you know, f the fact that they made an institute like this straight after independence uh, also speaks of the vision of the, uh, you know, of the prime minister and of the scientific community. The thought of the fact that drug discovery should be and should be a very very important uh, area of of work and research in the country, and that we should now start looking for our for drugs developed here. developed indigenously for diseases that affect the indian population which is exactly why when csir you know when cdri was made so uh, that's something that cdri focused on and i think over the years it's maintained that 
sort of uh, commitment i would say you know to two disease areas to, it concerns us to the nation and it's also added on for instance now for the last 5 years we have a strong group on cancer as well because you know cancer in, is on the rise in the country and so cancer research has also become not you know it's not a very big project but it's become a very important part of the of the disease areas we look at uh, diabetes has also come up and things like that so it's expanding and many many new people have joined many new people have come in with new ideas and new things to look at cdri also i think is a very interesting institute because it looks at drug discovery right from the synthesis of the molecule to the level at which it can go into clinical trials means but i think the uniqueness of the institute is that it brings together chemists and biologists and you know and clinical people together in teams to work on specific and even areas botanists. and even <laughs> people trained as botanists yes to work on specific areas together right. and i think that's its strength that's something that we need to really highlight which one was the award that you valued the most it's very difficult god i wouldn't want to even young scientist <laughs> award young scientist award i guess probably yeah. or i'm forcing you to say and i can't <laughs> no. i mean i can't say it i don't know which i mean my ma- masters awards were there are hardly any right. scientist who ever work for awards no, or money i know so uh, i'm not I sure i would want even want to say which award or whatever it was i mean they were nice as they came and but i was think i jealousy? enjoyed awards much more when i was younger as i grew older i sort of uh, okay we are moving fast towards the end of the pro- uh, program so would you like to uh, give up message to the younger generation do you see science and future of science bright in india i thought it was very bright till 2 years ago when we had this big funding crunch you know <laughs> i hope we get over that because many many programs had to shut down and i am quite unhappy because with this problem because um, a very important program that i was hoping to work on osdd malaria also had to take a back seat and we suffered because we had worked very hard for it and there were no funds to run it uh, but yeah apart from that so you the, have ups and downs what, ups and what downs, message do you I give to the it, younger generation but i think now we will i i hope we'll see a rise in science funding is something that scientists should push for also would be vocal about i think many of us just sit back and take whatever is coming and then say are sarkar ye nahi kar rahi hai i think that should stop i think we should be able to articulate our needs and to ask for things it's a very very exciting area i mean one loves being a scientist the whole thing of engagement in a lab with research is is really something that you, you know it's not work it's 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 joy right it's, it's, it's life it's, it's life so and i think when students come in that's what they are looking for also uh, unfortunately uh, i see over the last since you asked me this and for students over the last 15 years as i see my students coming they have a lot of information now but they have they seem to struggle with uh, with comprehending the way you actually design experiments or you know th- or or and think of a problem and putting the information in structures or think of a problem and solve it you know this this skill is going down and information uh, level is, is going, is going up. up which is not what is required for research really so that's something that they should look at and i think it's the way we do our courses now they are so information intensive without giving people time to think about things to read other stuff you know to have you know your your courses are designed so badly now in your masters generally there's a lot of information being given out to students and there's a very, there's very little project work that would help them think of problems and address questions and so on the other thing that i think that they need to look at so like science is exciting people must come for it and especially girls i think things are much much happier now you know institutions have become more gender friendly uh, even in remote areas i'm not talking right. of delhi you know i'm talking of more you know provincial sort of setups but it wasn't like that earlier things are very so you have seen this change of environment for the women I over a period seen. of time and it's a short period that you are talking about it's a short about. period and it's really about i think it's 10 years or 10 maybe 15, 15 years, years. Yeah. it's improved it things are improving there is more and consciousness about and it's a radical change that you are talking about i think it is the it's number of girl students has come up in the institute the, the the there is and there is a strong you know now there's there's a consciousness of the fact that you know girls boys both should have equal opportunity um, so that was the message given by a young scientist bright and outstanding scientist of the country we have run out of time eureka is over for the moment but we'll come back with another equally fascinating personality keep watching eureka